Chapter Fifteen of Armand Durand by Rosanna Le Proen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. It cannot be said that our hero was either as studious or as apt as he had been before his unfortunate marriage. He certainly was not who could tell the bright dreams and illusions he had had then to spur him on to exertion now it was all narrowed down to a mere strife for daily bread without one gleam of hope in the future one ray of joy in the present more than once mr laez had entered the office unexpectedly and found his student buried in moody reverie whilst piles of papers to be sorted or copied lay untouched on the desk before him the lawyer however had heard something of armand's troubles so he was considerate and merciful knowing that the young man's rare abilities would enable him later to make up for the time he was now losing slowly wearily to durand dragged on the tedious winter with its short days and long interminable evenings no pleasant social entertainments no quiet fireside hours to gild its course in the domestic circle matters were growing worse instead of better mrs martel's vituperativeness and delima's ill-humour but increased in proportion as they ascertained more thoroughly each day the invincible patience of their victim who despite of all however remained firm to his resolve of not applying for money to either friend or relative but there is such a thing as straining a bow too tight as filling a cup too full and this mrs martel was destined to find from her own experience as armand after a hasty dinner was preparing to leave for the office delima pettishly informed him she wanted money badly he instantly drew his slenderly filled purse from his pocket and gave it to her tis all i will have delima till next month but you are welcome to it the young wife opened it and scattered the trifling contents contemptuously on the table before her that is of no use she pouted but what do you specially want just now firstly a new coat for yourself yours is disgracefully shabby oh is that all he interrupted thanks mine will do well enough for this winter then if your coat will do my worn old furs won't they look perfectly disgraceful beside my fine new cloak yes that they do chimed in mrs martel for a bride too they look doubly bad i am sorry for it but i fear you will have to take this season out of them that she won't mr durand interrupted the hostess what business had you to take a wife if you can't dress her decently you forget you forced me to in spite of myself retorted durand who felt in an unusually irritable frame of mind yes i can testify to the truth of that added mr martel sotto voce just as i was married myself with angry countenance his wife turned on the speaker but the latter prudently left the battleground at once all this is not answering my question interrupted the young bride i have answered it already i've no more money to give you at present yes plenty if your pride would allow you to ask your rich relations but rather than do that you choose to live on charity armand's cheek flushed deeply how is that mrs martel do i not pay you regularly the sum you fixed yourself as the price of my own and wife's board Bah, a sum that does not half cover the expenses however if you won't write i will and i'll tell your aunt francoise your brother paul and perhaps too your former proud lady-love the stiff-necked miss de beauvoir how poor and miserably off your wretched wife is you had better not do it mrs martel rejoined armand with an unwonted look in his eyes which should have warned that sharp-witted matron she was going too far without noting it however and approaching still nearer she stared defiantly at him reiterating but i will do it i'll not allow me nor mine to know want when the scratch of a pen will bring them plenty 
no poor proud beggar shall impose on us or if we have to put up with such a thing the world shall at least know it suddenly yielding to one of the gusts of passion which notwithstanding the gentleness of his disposition at rare intervals swept over him armand suddenly turned upon his portly opponent and seizing her by the shoulder hurled her through the open door with a force that sent her crashing amongst the geranium pots which came down with herself in one confused heap now delima you will pack up your clothes without delay and be prepared to leave this house in an hour but she shan't go with you you monster exclaimed mrs martel rising from the debris of broken pots plants and earth you would kill her as you nearly killed me just now you hear me delima said our hero with stern calmness no i will not go with you hysterically sobbed the young wife as you will was the indifferent reply i have no intention of insisting on my rights and he quietly left the room and passed into his own at once he entered on the toils of packing up which with him was the very simple process of thrusting into his trunks clothes books brushes in the order they came to hand at the end of a half hour his task was complete then he suddenly remembered that at the commencement of the late stormy interview he had given his purse to delima what was he to do fortunately he had a few dollars put up to pay an account for some law book lately purchased and knowing the bookseller would wait he resolved on appropriating it to present use he glanced at his watch three-quarters of an hour had elapsed already well he would wait one hour as he had told his wife and at the expiration of that time he would leave if she chose to accompany him he was satisfied if she decided on remaining he would not say a word to dissuade her from it again another look at his timepiece four three two minutes ah the hour was up and he took his cap when the door slowly opened and his wife flushed and tearful entered are you coming with me delima yes dress then quickly for we have no time to lose i will go for a carriole where are we to go to she sobbed completely subdued and sinking helplessly into a chair do not be anxious we can easily obtain comfortable lodgings for the price we pay here i have a respectable quiet house in view at which i will make arrangements at once and then return for you it will give you a little time to pack up your ribbons and flowers on his way out he saw no signs of mrs martel but he encountered her husband who had been instructed to waylay armand and win him over if possible to friendlier feelings why how is this armand you are not really going to leave us yes mr martel and i deeply regret it is under such unpleasant circumstances take a little time armand to decide do not leave immediately nothing would induce me to remain even a night longer allons allons what signify a few hot words more or less my wife is already sorry for the past and willing to make friends if you'll consent i have no objection to the latter proposition and i am exceedingly sorry myself for the violence i displayed during the dispute but my mind is irrevocably made up nor am i surprised at it ejaculated martel treacherously going over to the enemy you have suffered a great deal and now that you have thrown off your chains i cannot wonder at your not wishing to put them on again you frightened the bonne femme thoroughly but as you fortunately did not hurt her i bear you no malice she said she thought all along that you had the heart of a mouse but she finds instead you have that of a lion i disclaim the compliment if it is intended as one and feel heartily ashamed of my exhibition of lion-heartedness but time presses i must be off before leaving however i must thank you mr martel heartily and sincerely for the kindness you have invariably shown me during my stay under your roof 
andre coughed and his voice was somewhat unsteady as he rejoined god bless you armand from first to last you have acted as a true gentleman i hope little delima may prove worthy of you within an hour durand returned for his wife and drowned in tears she stepped into the sleigh without uttering a word having already made her adieus to the family arrived at their new residence which seemed both orderly and comfortable armand proceeded to take possession of their small though neat apartment by unpacking and hanging up his clothes placing his books and papers in their respective places delima meanwhile sat disconsolately on a trunk breaking forth every now and then into a fresh outburst of weeping when the tea-bell rang she indignantly declined that refreshment so armand went down alone the meal was certainly a great improvement on the niggardly repasts spread before him of late and the reflection a pleasant one that henceforth they could be taken in peace without a running accompaniment of reproaches and recriminations there were but four other boarders two old maiden sisters neat in dress and prim in speech and a quiet middle-aged married couple with whom however and the chatty smiling hostess a sufficiently lively conversation was kept up when armand returned to his own room he found it somewhat cheerless the fire having gone down delima had cried herself asleep in an easy chair and as the rays of the candle beside her streamed full on her pale tear-stained face his heart smote him despite the constant provocation and annoyance he received from her she looked so young so fragile and now she was so utterly dependent on him he quickly started the fire again sought out the hostess to ask that a cup of tea might be sent up to mrs durand as she was ill a request willingly acceded to and then returned to awake his wife she again refused the proposed refreshment after it had been brought to her and renewed her sobbing interspersed with passionate grievings over her own sad fate and desolate condition after a few words of unavailing consolation the lamentations meanwhile redoubling he gravely said if you are so utterly wretched delima i see but one alternative you must return to mrs martel's where apparently you can alone be happy i will give as much as i can possibly afford towards your support increasing the sum when i will be able it is too late now but to-morrow morning you can leave this i will do no such thing interrupted the fair bride with much vivacity though i suppose you would be well pleased if i did finding it probably a good riddance stung to energy by this thought she sprang to her feet and commenced arranging her disordered toilette and sorting out what few articles of clothing she had brought with her mrs martel having promised that the remainder should be ready when sent for when the bridegroom returned the following day from the office he was agreeably surprised to find his fairer half seated at her sewing in the little drawing-room and engaged in pleasant chat with one of the lady boarders he was further gratified by her whispered assurance that she felt happier and more comfortable than at mrs martel's abode now had armand durand possessed a little more determination of character had he been able to follow up his signal domestic victory by a certain firmness of manner and purpose all might yet have gone on tolerably well but unfortunately such was not the case and when after a time mrs martel became a frequent caller at their present residence and delima passed a great portion of her time in reciprocating these visits he never interfered the moral results of this intercourse were plainly perceptible in the growing independence and exacting character of the young wife who seemed to think the chief aim of existence now was to dress herself as elaborately and extravagantly as possible armand on his side drudged on perseveringly at his office duties though at times with a feeling of dreary discouragement he could scarcely combat 
no farther intercourse had passed between himself and paul subsequently to his returning to the latter his epistle containing an offer of money but at new year's a brief letter came to him from tante ratelle in which was enclosed a present of fifty pounds there was no mention of the bride in this missive nor any wish however faintly expressed to make her acquaintance unfortunately mrs ratelle had heard from good authority a very accurate description of her character and learned thus how poor how utterly worthless was the prize for which her ill-starred nephew had paid such a price the fifty pounds was soon coaxed from him and instead of being devoted at least in part to the liquidation of some debts contracted by the young couple was laid out in the purchase of a new set of furs for delima and a suit of outdoor costume rivalling in elegance the toilettes of miss de beauvoir herself mrs martel was not forgotten in this unequal partition of aunt ratelle's new year's gift and a handsome new cloak out of it fell to her share the lapse of a few months found the bride who had been so much enchanted at first with boarding-house life utterly tired of it the boarders were so ill-natured and sarcastic to her the landlady so rude and disagreeable that she scarcely dared to ask for a glass of water between meals and she herself so tired of being obliged to always eat sit and live under the constant supervision of strangers that she had come to the conclusion she would rather starve in a little home of her own even a garret than remain where she was at present of course mrs martel was at the bottom of all this repining and discontent that wily mischief-maker found she had but very little comfort or liberty in her visits to the young wife there was no possibility of cosy tea-drinkings or long pleasant evenings crowned by a hot supper in short delima might as well be in saint laurent for all the comfort or profit there was now in her society prompted by such ill-judged innuendos and advice young mrs durand soon made herself intensely disagreeable to her fellow boarders and her affectation and airs of superiority were resented with considerable warmth every evening when our hero returned from the office there was a fresh grievance to relate a new tale of oppression and unkindness to impart till he began insensibly to dread his return to his present abode almost as much as he had once done that to mrs martel's hospitable domicile delima would vary the tale at other times by dwelling on the happiness they would enjoy in a home of their own no matter how humble and on the economy and housekeeping ability she would display in the administration of said home the picture was tempting and armand often found himself wondering how it could be accomplished and if his independence and pride would ever allow him to solicit his aunt ratelle's aid in bringing it about destiny settled the matter by favoring him with an accidental meeting with tante francoise who had come to town for the first time since the death of her brother paul durand armand his young wife leaning on his arm met her face to face as she was coming out of one of the low-browed dingy shops of which many still characterized montreal at that period remembering all her former kindness the young man was really overjoyed by the meeting and plainly evinced by look and word the pleasure he felt mrs ratelle's first coldness soon thawed under the subtle charm of armand's affectionate greeting and to pressing solicitations of the young couple that she would return with them and partake of their present landlady's hospitality she returned an answer in the negative but counterbalanced her refusal by inviting them to dine with her in the quiet respectable hotel where she put up the invitation was at once accepted and the banquet came off triumphantly true mrs ratelle viewed with considerable disfavor the costly furs and elegant mantle adorning the wife of a poor law student 
but delima looked so very young and lovely and rendered herself so charming resuming for that purpose the gentle coaxing ways which had characterized her before marriage that tante francoise felt the prejudices she had conceived against her fast wearing away with an openness which the elder lady rather appreciated than otherwise the bride enlarged on her ardent desire to be in a home of her own not forgetting to indulge at the same time in one of her usual brilliant dreams of faultless housekeeping but child exclaimed aunt ratelle dryly in answer to this latter rhapsody i cannot imagine so finely dressed a lady as you are looking after pots and pans pickles and preserves you would do better in a salon ah tante francoise rejoined delima adopting at once the title by which armand addressed his aunt i dress so finely because i have nothing else to do if i had a little home of my own how different it would be i would have something more useful to think of than finery mrs ratelle said no more on the subject and when the young couple took leave she asked her nephew to return in the evening to have a talk with her of course he willingly complied and the night was far advanced when the conference came to an end much had they to speak of but through the course of that long conversation the young man was wonderfully reticent on the subject of his own domestic annoyances as well as on the manoeuvring that had been employed to bring about his marriage amongst other items of home news mrs ratelle told him that paul remained always quietly in the old homestead but had grown unusually gloomy and taciturn whilst his interest in agriculture and farming had considerably diminished he seemed to have no thought of matrimony though if so disposed he could have his choice among some of the prettiest girls in alonville he never mentioned armand's name nor alluded in any manner to the events that had transpired at the time of their father's death though she suspected he brooded the more deeply over them for all that turning probably for consolation to stimulants with a frequency that filled her with anxiety and misgiving then mrs ratelle spoke of our hero's affairs and asked him if he desired as much as his wife to have a fireside of his own remembering the tiresome complaints and tirades inflicted on him every evening by delima he heartily answered in the affirmative his reply evidently found favor in the eyes of tante francoise who secretly feared that the present inactive life the bride was leading might inoculate her with idle extravagant ideas and render her unfit at a later period for assuming the management of a household the end of all this was that armand was to be put in immediate possession of the legacy left her by his father a portion of which wisely invested would ensure a reasonable annual interest whilst a sufficient sum could be deducted to set up housekeeping at once though on the smallest possible scale i hope nephew our decision has been a prudent one said aunt ratelle impressively some might say that it would have been wiser to have left things as they were but you are now a married man surely fit to be trusted with the direction of your own affairs two qualities are eminently necessary for you economy and firmness see that you fail in neither end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of armand durand by rosanna le Proan. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what a triumphant day that was for delima when after having wearily travelled with her husband over half the city in search of some habitation that came up to her ideal standard they found a cottage at a low rent in st joseph street containing the requisite number of cupboards and closets with the small veranda in front which she regarded as indispensable 
then when armand who had the usual masculine aversion to shopping put a well-filled purse into her hand before leaving for the office giving her carte blanche to lay it out according to her own discretion how joyous and exultant she was her first step of course was to go in search of mrs martel and that matron successively drove the clerks of at least a dozen different stores to the verge of desperation by pricing haggling depreciating the goods displayed before her and altering her mind several times before she concluded any bargain her assistance however was invaluable to the embryo housekeeper but for her prudent interference the latter guided by the same tastes which directed her purchases in dress would have invested the three-quarters of her capital in an expensive carpet embellished with lilies and roses and a set of drawing-room furniture to match as unsuited to their circumstances as were her own silks and laces on mrs martel's angrily asking what she would buy the stove and kitchen requisites with she consented with a heavy sigh to satisfy herself with something less costly whilst discontentedly surveying the sober though comfortable-looking drugget and plain chairs and table chosen by mrs martel the latter sharply whispered tis somewhat of an improvement my girl on the bare floor and the wooden chairs and settle of the best room in the old farmhouse at st laurent the bride who in the midst of her new-found grandeur had almost succeeded in banishing such reminiscences as she did the thought of the aged work-worn grandfather who had brought her up coloured deeply and determinedly closed her lips never opening them again till they had left the store there were several days of such shopping but at length all the chattels came home the furniture was placed and the bride and bridegroom took possession of their new abode delima was triumphant armand contented because she was so and mrs martel who had considerately invited herself to tea under pretext of starting the young housekeeper fairly on her way majestic and complacent as though to say all my work difficulties however soon beset the path each day brought with it a discovery more or less unwelcome first the kitchen swarmed with beetles and cockroaches and delima was so much afraid of these specimens of entomology that her shrieks were heard re-echoing through the house every time she descended to that region the most approved method of getting rid of the plague was of course at once adopted though only with partial success next the chimney smoked in the most capricious manner sometimes on the changing of the wind to certain quarters threatening armand and his wife with the fate of the inhabitants of pompeii in the shape of clouds of ashes whirled in their faces with masses of pungent smoke as they sat beside their fireside a recollect chimney cowl partly mended this and their attention was then called to another grievance the roof in one part of the house badly leaked and the moisture had slyly trickled down into the sacred closet where delima's splendid holiday silk was suspended and had elaborately streaked and spotted it all over like an arabesque scroll these misadventures were repaired by the mending of the roof and the purchase of another dress fate had not yet finished its persecutions for the cellar was now invaded by rats before the horror of whose presence the terror inspired by the beetles faded into nothing into this latter stronghold of the enemy delima would never venture alone so armand had to accompany her on pilgrimages for the materiel of their meals till he felt he would almost prefer living on anchorite's fare bread and water if it would free him from the migratory state into which he was plunged whenever he crossed the threshold of his abode a cat was procured but she confined her exertions to robbing the pantry and breaking an unimaginable amount of delf till she became more destructive than the rats themselves meanwhile how did delima's housekeeping thrive did her husband find the reality come up to the golden visions she had previously indulged in 
the fact was that bewildered by the appalling discoveries of each successive day and distracted by plans and conjectures for remedying these evils armand scarcely noted that the cakes were solid and heavy the meats burned or rare according to the strength of the fire and the soups an indescribable mixture of greasy fluid with lumps of half raw vegetables swimming complacently through it when the young husband alluded which he only did at rare intervals to these phenomena delima indignantly asked how could she cook anything well beset by all sorts of horrors as she was and blinded stupefied by smoking chimneys and leaking roofs the argument seemed good at least armand chose to take it as such and he proposed remedying all their troubles by procuring additional aid in the shape of a girl whose equanimity would be proof against the terrors which exerted so powerful an influence on the nerves of delima the latter willingly assented to his proposal and arrayed again in silken raiment bejewelled and beringed the young wife felt very important and dignified issuing orders to her handmaiden but alas lisette was somewhat susceptible and a lively warfare was soon inaugurated between mistress and maid delima who had no idea of what true dignity consisted in endeavoured to make up by arrogance and constant fault-finding for the want of that calm justice and perfect self-command so necessary to those whose lot it is to govern every evening now when the hapless husband arrived at home instead of that light feminine chit-chat which is a very pleasant thing in its time and place or that perfect repose and quiet which often renders a domestic hearth equally agreeable he had to listen to wearisome repetitions of lisette's shortcomings and of the series of outrages she had inflicted on her much enduring mistress why do you not send her away then and get another would armand ask distractedly running his hand through his thick wavy locks till they stood almost on end but that did not suit mrs durand she knew lisette was an excellent servant industrious hard-working and honest and she only wanted the luxury of grumbling mrs martel's visits became more and more frequent meanwhile and her appearance at their social board a thing of more frequent recurrence the species of shamefacedness which she had displayed during her first visits soon disappeared and gave place to tirades against the incompetency and uselessness of lisette interspersed with occasional hints intended for the reproof or edification of the head of the establishment one day that the two ladies were discussing the demerits of the much-tried domestic the kitchen door purposely left open in order that she might profit of this candid analysis of her character lisette burst impetuously into the room informed its occupants that it was easy seeing they were not used to having servants that she lisette who had lived with real ladies before she came to them could tell they were upstarts and that she would not spend another night with them for any consideration hereupon her young mistress recovering from the state of breathless amazement into which this onset had thrown her sternly informed the excited abigail that if she carried her threat of leaving on such short notice into execution she would not only forfeit her month's wages but would also receive a character that would prevent any one else employing her the girl independently replied that when she wanted a character she would apply to one of the real ladies she had lived with before the commencement of this exciting scene armand had hastily retreated into the inner room and closed the door but of course the voices of the disputants penetrated full and clear through all intervening obstacles he was not surprised therefore when lisette shortly after made her appearance and having briefly stated that she could not remain in the place any longer asked for her wages having overheard all the provocation that had led to this outburst durand paid her demands without remark 
and shortly after on glancing out of the window beheld her bundle in hand passing out into the street a moment after delima rushed breathlessly into the room followed soon by mrs martel surely armand you did not pay her for this month yes why not why not did you hear all the insolence she gave me you did you say and you can ask why not armand durand you have not the spirit of a man or you would not have sat tamely there whilst your wife was insulted and abused and then have paid the wretch who did it here mrs martel groaned aloud but you were two to one against her answered armand and certainly well able for your adversary ah so not content with encouraging her by your silence paying her the wages she had forfeited you take her part too angrily questioned the young wife a louder and more indignant groan from mrs martel and a cough evidently preliminary to her taking active part in the engagement at which armand hastily caught up his hat and muttering something about other business to attend to left the house the business thus vaguely alluded to consisted in strolling about for an hour or so till it was time to return to the office where he took his seat mentally congratulating himself on having such a sure and tranquil asylum as the hour of departure arrived and he was gathering up almost unwillingly some books and papers he wished to take home with him he was inexpressibly surprised by seeing the well-dressed but old-fashioned figure of tante francoise entering at the door she had come to town on unexpected business and knowing she would find armand at his office had called there so as to have his escort to his new abode for delima in the first flush of gratitude consequent on the magnificent donation which had enabled them to commence housekeeping had insisted pertinaciously on mrs ratelle's promising that she would make her home with them whenever she should come to town on arriving with his companion at the comfortable little cottage in st joseph street armand opened the door with his latch-key inwardly tormented by strong misgivings as to the frame of mind he would find his young wife in after the exciting scenes of the day the reality however he was totally unprepared for the fires were out and the rooms empty and deserted delima having gone out with mrs martel after previously concerting with the latter to punish her husband for his contumacy by spending the evening from home and leaving him to the resources of bachelor skill everything was in the condition it had been in at the commencement of hostilities the furniture disordered the carpet littered with crumbs scraps of thread paper whilst the door leading into the kitchen which stood half open afforded a view of a table piled with unwashed dishes an ashes strewn hearth and an unswept floor the shock this spectacle inflicted on aunt francoise with her unbounded love of order and housewifely neatness was indescribable armand mortified and confounded muttered something about delima having been obliged to go out with her cousin mrs martel their servant having suddenly left the keeping of a domestic was a new revelation to his spellbound companion and then prayed her to sit down whilst he lighted a fire the one sole branch of domestic economy he had a clear idea of silently she assented and as her eye wandered from the slight handsome figure of her nephew bending over the sullen fire to the confusion and discomfort throned as it were all around her her thoughts went back to the early married life of armand's father and her own repining at the choice he had made as far as regarded domestic comfort or good management there was a strange similarity apparently between the lot of father and son but there she acknowledged to herself with a sinking heart the resemblance ended the gentle loving genevieve would never have left her husband surrounded by discomfort and confusion to seek amusement for herself elsewhere at least if she had not acquired the art of keeping her home in that exquisite order which renders the poorest hut attractive 
she was always there to welcome him on his return with her soft sweet voice and loving looks and smiles mrs ratelle had once fearlessly expressed to her brother her unqualified disapprobation of the system or rather the want of it that reigned in his household for strong in his passionate love for his wife and in that wife's entire devotion to himself he could bear to hear bitter or unpalatable truths but what tower of strength had armand to shelter him looking in his worn saddened face and recalling all that she had heard all that she herself had seen the answer arose within her own aching heart none none ah by not one word of criticism or censure however loudly called for would she add one feather's weight to the burden that already weighed so heavily on him and when he came towards her saying with forced cheerfulness at least tante francoise if we have no supper we shall have a good fire she quickly rose to her feet and smiled pleasantly as she answered but indeed nephew armand we shall have both having divested herself of her outdoor habiliments she took up a towel lying on a chair near and after carefully pinning it so as to protect her dress and fastening back the muslin strings of her cap exclaimed now you shall see that la vieille tante has not forgotten her olden craft notwithstanding her nephew's remonstrances she entered with alacrity on the task of reducing the chaos that reigned in the kitchen to order it was soon done and not very long after a comfortable supper of hot toast ham and eggs the household larder was well stocked laid on the table during the course of the meal she cheerfully questioned him about his prospects expressing her satisfaction that he was pursuing his law studies so closely but little very little said she concerning his domestic affairs once only after a long silence she laid her hand softly on his and whispered as she looked wistfully in his face armand my son i fear you are not happy he made no reply beyond kindly pressing her hand and slightly averting his face silence then fell on both again and it lasted till a knocking at the door aroused them armand opened it and his young wife with a half sullen half defiant look on her beautiful face entered how do you like bachelor housekeeping she questioned tartly you had so much sympathy for lisette that tante francoise is here he gravely interrupted confused and ashamed delima hastily turned and as she embraced mrs ratelle the latter icily enduring not returning the salute muttered something about being sorry she had not known that she was coming as she would have returned early to give her supper why child should you show more attention or kindness to me than you do to your husband his claims on you are far greater than mine the pretty mouth pouted the smooth young brow contracted and with a slight toss of her head she turned away to undress how little had poor tante francoise thought in those long past days when she bore so severely on genevieve's miserable housekeeping that a time would come when she would recall with aching yearning her loving smiles and gentle ways feeling they almost atoned for all other deficiencies repining however was useless and she resolved on avoiding all verbal expressions of it two days more she passed with the young couple for she had business in town that compelled her to remain and during that time she saw enough of delima's management and of armand's domestic felicity to make her wish that she had never come her parting with the bride was rather a stormy one she told her in quiet stern tones how deficient she found her in all the qualities that constituted a good wife plainly intimating that future favors and presents would depend entirely on the amendment of delima's conduct and then when the latter waxed warm and impertinent aunt ratelle held her peace and quietly left the house 
rodolphe belfond occasionally called to see his early college friend but on all such occasions the young wife instead of leaving her husband and visitor to enjoy a talk together always joined them dressed with elaborate elegance and with her silly chatter and still more absurd affectation contrived to render the visit wearisome to host and guest at other times when under the influence of ill-temper she contrived to make matters equally unpleasant by scolding in a raised key at the much enduring successor to lisette or bustling in and out with a great display of brushing dusting and cleaning endeavouring to make her two victims feel uncomfortably awake to the impression that they were greatly in the way fortunately belfond was not much troubled with shyness or over-sensitiveness so he generally sat on unmoved and unruffled in the midst of the storm and thinking whilst he calmly contemplated the irate countenance of delima how quickly and thoroughly he would tame that beautiful shrew if he were in his friend's place marvelling all the while at the latter's weakness but pitying whilst he condemned him care of however a deeper sort was beginning to brood over the young household the money given by mrs ratelle had been spent with a lavish thoughtlessness which that worthy lady had never contemplated the only branch of usefulness which delima possessed in any degree was the knowledge of her needle and in that she certainly excelled but even though dresses mantles and all the dainty little articles of ornament in which she so much delighted as well as her husband's sewing or mending were all done by herself that one branch of economy could not atone for the utter want of system or good management which pervaded every other department of household government when the young wife asked for money armand at once gave it to her generally without inquiring for what it was wanted lest his doing so should bring on an altercation but when the constant inroads thus made on their little fortune had terribly diminished it and he began to enlarge on the fact and on the consequent necessity for economy she paid but little heed mentally reassuring herself with the thought that when their purse was empty they could apply to tante françoise when this time came and delima without consulting her husband privately wrote to mrs ratelle an epistle portraying in the most vivid terms their destitution and which notwithstanding the intense study and application it had cost her was nevertheless a marvel of bad grammar and orthography the answer soon came short sharp and decisive mrs ratelle had already given them a sum sufficient if managed with proper care to place them above the necessity of applying for assistance for a much longer period mrs durand must learn to be less extravagant in her dress and household expenditures before she could extend to her farther help there was an expression of surprise too that young mrs durand who must necessarily have been brought up in habits of the strictest economy should find it so difficult now to practice them in the first burst of anger excited by this frank communication delima showed it to her husband but she was unprepared for the bitterness with which he upbraided her for having taken such a step without consulting him and for the want of proper pride or dignity which had suffered her to make the appeal little by little that part of the sum which was destined through the interest drawn from it to afford them a small annual income was expended some of it having been devoted by armand much against his wife's will to paying off various trifling debts contracted during the first months of their marriage and with poverty thus close at hand retrenchment was imperatively called for the servant was dismissed the expenses of dress and table diminished and delima changing at once from one extreme to the other degenerated from an overdressed puppet into a tawdry slattern of course character too participated in this change for the worst and frowning discontented looks and weak wearisome repinings over her miserable destiny were now alone heard in our hero's unhappy home 
mrs ratelle's customary new year's gift of fifty pounds arrived in time to shield them from actual want and armand after desperate efforts procured some copying to do which brought him a trifling pittance in return for hours of close unremitting toil when his office hours were over one by one many superfluous household articles some of which need never have been purchased at all were disposed of to supply present necessities and over each sacrifice of this kind delima would grieve and lament as if it were the severing of one of her heart-strings mrs martel now a constant visitor at the cottage would join vigorously in these lamentations shaking her head over and over again and pitifully murmuring oh my poor poor delima till durand felt at times as if he would go distracted on one occasion that the young wife had been unusually loud in her complaints and her female relative equally so in her condolences armand reduced them to utter silence by turning on the visitor and informing her the best thing she could do for the happiness of all parties would be to take delima back with her and keep her till he had a wealthier or pleasanter home to offer her but this outburst was a rare event and the moral influence it exerted soon passed away leaving his feminine adversaries again victors of the field whilst bearing up as best he could against the adverse circumstances surrounding him one day yielding to discouragement and despair the next renewing his resolves to battle bravely with his fate and conquer it if possible a messenger arrived from alonville bidding him hasten thither immediately as mrs ratelle had been struck by paralysis and now lay at the point of death of course armand grieved shocked prepared to start without a moment's delay but delima willingly availed herself of the excuse afforded by bad roads and inclement weather to decline accompanying him he arrived in time to receive good kind tante francoise's last blessing to hear a few words of advice and sympathy when another stroke of the relentless enemy closed the scene the desolation of armand's feelings as he stood beside that rigid motionless form no words could convey she was the last being on earth who really loved him all faith in his wife's affection had long since passed away that dulled cold ear the only one in which he cared to whisper his griefs or plans and now the future that lay before him was uncheered by hope of sympathy from any true or loving heart a few measured quiet words passed between himself and paul the latter awkward and constrained the elder brother preoccupied and indifferent but that was the extent of their intercourse after the funeral which the brothers followed side by side the village notary put a letter in armand's hand which mrs ratelle had directed should be given him after her death adding at the same time that he was ready to read to him the will of the deceased the epistle dated the morning before armand's arrival was written tremulously almost illegibly but was tenderly affectionate in strain sympathizing with him in his unhappiness and bidding him look for consolation to that source whence she so abundantly derived it the hope of a future life she then went on to say that with the exception of some charitable bequests and a present to paul she left armand her sole heir but foreseeing from delima's extravagance and his own thoughtlessness where money was concerned amply proved by the lavish manner in which the large sum she had before put them in possession of had been expended that if the legacy were left them free from any restraining conditions it would speedily be spent leaving them soon again a prey to poverty she desired that armand should only receive the yearly interest of the money bequeathed him for the space of seven years at the expiration of which time he should enter on its enjoyment untrammelled by farther conditions when our hero was again reinstated in his home and related to his wife the details of mrs ratelle's death and the contents of the will 
delima could scarcely conceal her disappointment only a hundred and twenty pounds a year for seven long years she discontentedly repeated just a little more than the sum we have been starving on why we may both be dead before the close of that time if so it would not prove an event greatly to be regretted rejoined armand speaking out of the bitterness of his heart surely our life is not such a pleasant one it would be if we had plenty of money was the unwomanly reply no amount of money could bring happiness to our home sorrowfully thought the young husband but he held his peace End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of armand durand by rosanna le proan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary a few more months of weary struggling battling with poverty and domestic troubles then another change in the drama mr la Haise, the kind and intelligent lawyer with whom armand studied was taken ill and after many alternations from worse to better paid the debt of nature this last stroke was most keenly felt by our hero it seemed to him that one by one every human being who had loved or shown him any interest was taken away he did not reflect that they were ripe in years their deaths events in the order of nature to be soon expected he only felt the dull blank each decease left in his life and hopes for many days after mr la Haise's funeral he remained quiet inactive at home occupying himself with a pretence of copying some law papers but in reality yielding more and more to the discouragement creeping over him was it apathy or was it illness he could not tell which he knew no farther time should be lost in seeking out a successor to the late mr la Haise, under whose auspices he might continue his legal studies but a strange aversion to the profession he had embraced was taking possession of him how he mentally asked himself could he afford to lose so much valuable time acquiring knowledge that might never bring him any return even if he successfully pursued his legal studies and passed his examination a thing which in his present state of despondency he felt very doubtful of what assurance had he that clients would come briefs be given him at the very best it would be long before such could be the case and in the meantime debts and difficulties were closing in around him and poverty sitting like a spectre at his hearthside one dark stormy morning he had risen with these thoughts and they had clung to him with relentless pertinacity through its course heedless of delima's reproaches regarding his idleness of her loud lamentations over her fate he sat with head bowed in his hands motionless as a statue through long weary hours not planning nor proposing but blankly yielding to despair suddenly a friendly hand was laid on his shoulder and a friendly voice cheerfully exclaimed hello armand you have been taking a nap i have said good day to you twice and have not yet had an answer armand looked up with a forced smile endeavouring evidently to frame a reply when delima's shrill voice interposed indeed then he has chosen a wrong time to take daylight naps in when we have scarcely the price of a dinner in the house he would in spite of me fritter away the greater part of this month's money in paying debts as if we could afford that i sold my watch yesterday morning and surely the price of it has not all gone for the few scanty meals we have had since then replied the young husband wearily delima reddened she had not expected such frankness on his part before a third party but determined not to be put down retorted it will be though before you think of getting me any more and then i suppose we may starve armand passed his hand across his forehead while an unusual look of suffering clouded his dark languid-looking eyes my dear mrs durand 
interposed belfond controlling with great difficulty his intense indignation at her ill-humour and heartlessness you see that your husband is not well pray leave him alone with me for a short while as i have something of importance to say to him in her tawdry untidy state her splendid wavy hair escaping here and there in disorderly masses from her comb she flounced from the room confound her escaped from the visitor's lips before he had time to check himself the languid eyes looked sorrowfully at him and he hurriedly entreatingly said forgive me armand for heaven's sake but at the sight of you so worried and ill-looking i scarcely know what i am doing or saying oh friend friend i could cry like a very woman to see you thus and he tenderly laid his hand on that of his companion whilst his honest manly eyes filled with tears but diantre he abruptly said hastily dashing away these evidences of weakness it was not to indulge in jeremiads i came here but to see if i could not be of service to you you need not flush up so hotly i know if i offered you money or loan you would say as you did before had you intended accepting either you would not have exposed your wants so openly though so indeed in your place i would not stand in such an absurd manner on my dignity to something else i would propose to you and which you can accept without forfeiting one tittle of that independence on which you set such store i have written to my cousin duchene in quebec who is one of the leading lawyers there and who will willingly take you into his office at once giving you all the advantages and indeed many more than you enjoyed with mr la Haise. the fact is he is most anxious to have you with him having heard your character and abilities very highly spoken of in several quarters armand suspecting to whose good offices the interest taken in him by mr duchene was attributable shook his head belfond waverings are at an end and my mind firmly made up to abandon the profession chosen in more prosperous times no no you will not do that armand you will not play so cowardly a part listen to me sell off your furniture here the proceeds of the sale will not only enable you to pay your expenses and those of your wife to quebec but leave you with something in hand arrived there take a room in some respectable quiet boarding-house and then enter cousin duchene's office at once if you are too selfish too stiff-necked to give me the pleasure of lending you what i know you will soon be able to repay you will still have enough to start with in the struggle and you can rough it in quebec as you have done here duchene has promised me that he will ensure you plenty of copying you can take a couple of scholars in the evening if necessary in short do anything rather than give up the profession on whose dry thorny road you have already advanced so far and which may ultimately lead you to honour and fortune but success is so uncertain muttered armand and the period of probation so long i might be able to procure at once some situation or clerkship which would bring me in a good salary and what then you would still perhaps be a clerk at the same salary in five years from this still the idea would be a very fair one if you had not already entered on another career listen armand promise to give cousin duchene a trial do you remember rodolphe that long past day in our college life which witnessed the beginning of this our true and lasting friendship and yet whose first step was my springing at your throat like a bulldog and nearly strangling you well as i stood then at bay harassed desperate enemies and troubles all around me so do i now stand to-day but you forget with a true friend at your side who unluckily for you has the foible of always wanting to give you advice you see one great advantage that will result from your removal to quebec will be the freeing your wife from the pernicious influence of that old she-dragon relative of hers who i suppose is always putting mischief into her pretty little head if after having tried my plan you still continue to sigh for a change 
i will undertake to procure you a good situation later i have friends and cousins too among our quebec merchants long belfond reasoned and persuaded his friend wavering more and more till he finally yielded and when they separated the look of blank despair had passed from armand's countenance when our hero first announced his intention of removing his household gods to quebec a rare domestic scene ensued delima wept stormed all but fainted and mrs martel loudly declared that the shock of a separation in her present delicate state of health would kill her that none but a madman or monster would think of dragging a delicate young creature away among strangers from the friends she was so deeply attached to to all this armand had but one answer which was a perfect stronghold as it were against the enemy if his young wife found the arrangement so unbearable she was at perfect liberty to remain with her friends this proposition however not meeting the general views either hostilities were abandoned lest perhaps in a fit of anger he should enforce it and delima contented herself with going about the house in a state of tearful misery their wardrobes were packed up and the auction held this latter was quite successful many trifling articles being bid upon or bought up at comparatively high prices by a humble-looking though comfortably dressed individual in the crowd whom no one suspected of being a messenger of rodolphe belfond with a dark wintry sky overhead whose gray clouds presaged a heavy snowstorm though a considerable quantity had already fallen the previous night our hero set out with his young wife for the new city in which they were to try their fortunes the appearances of the weather were so little encouraging that he would willingly have delayed his departure for another day but the farmer who had agreed to take them for a moderate sum in his comfortable carriole could not wait they brought but one small trunk containing changes of wearing apparel belfond having undertaken to see the remainder forwarded by the first safe opportunity when they started delima was sobbing bitterly armand revolving dreary thoughts and sombre anticipations and both so preoccupied that they were almost unconscious of the thickly falling snow and the murky sky overhead they stopped for dinner at a little village inn where a plate of excellent soup and a mutton fricassee was served to them and of which delima who was beginning to recover her spirits having had her cry out heartily partook they were soon en route again but in consequence of the quantity of snow that had fallen the roads were very heavy and the stout canadian horse whose sinews seemed made of iron floundered and struggled gallantly on in the midst of the snowdrifts shaking back every now and then from eyes and mane the icy particles plentifully besprinkling them how eagerly the travellers began to look forward to their arrival at the little village in the inn of which they were to pass the night the wind was keen and sharp but armand contrived to keep his wife well shielded from its biting breath by the thick buffalo robes with which they were liberally provided at length lights began to twinkle through the snow-filled atmosphere and with a sentiment of intense satisfaction the wearied party drew up at the long looked-for inn travellers had preceded them for the sound of voices came through the door of the little parlour which was ajar and there was a great bustle and appetizing odour about the stove in the outer apartment close to which a couple of farmers were smoking and drinking delima in wretched temper seated herself on the chair nearest at hand but the host at once asked madame and monsieur to step into the other room they did so and found themselves most unexpectedly in the presence of mrs and miss de beauvoir armand overcome with astonishment fell back a step or two his cheek crimson and then recovering himself bowed politely to both ladies mrs de beauvoir replied by a stately though civil inclination of her head but gertrude apparently beset by the same embarrassment which had taken possession of young durand colored deeply then hesitatingly bowed 
delima recognized the ladies at once having occasionally seen them in public whilst in montreal she noticed the mutual though momentary embarrassment of her husband and the high-bred aristocratic young girl who she felt despite her own rare beauty and elaborately elegant dress was yet so vastly her superior piqued at this piqued at the coldness of the strangers which afforded no encouragement to an introduction or acquaintance she asked with an air of affected dignity could he not get one of the servants to help her in taking off her wraps they are too busy he whispered pray let me do it bent on showing her importance and her power over her husband she peevishly retorted no you are too awkward do go and see if you cannot get me proper assistance what could he do but yield refusal would only bring on a scene after a short absence he returned tis as i feared delima every one is busy tis too bad she exclaimed with the same ridiculous air of self-assertion what a miserable place you have stopped at well help me off with my cloak armand fairly overwhelmed with mortification and shame endeavoured to comply conscious all the while that the cold sarcastic gaze of mrs de beauvoir was bent upon them her daughter either through compassion for our hero or impatience at the absurd pretensions of his companion had seated herself with a book near the tallow candle that burned dimly on the table and however her attention may have wandered from its pages her eyes never did the servant soon came in to lay the table for supper and the comedy in which delima was chief actress continued though the two ladies who were accustomed to every luxury found no verbal fault with the repast mrs de beauvoir contenting herself with shuddering when she tasted the tea and inspected the pork omelette which latter she left untouched on her plate delima who partook liberally enough of both was loud in her condemnation of everything a couple of times she had contrived to whisper to her husband introduce me to them and fearing that she would be overheard he took the first step towards satisfying her by endeavouring to get up a few words of conversation with mrs de beauvoir to his inquiry if she intended proceeding on her journey the following morning despite the condition of the roads she briefly answered yes nothing but the difficulty of travelling by night in such heavy roads would have induced her to remain so long in their present abode he then inquired if mr de courval were well yes thank you and she rose from the supper-table as if to terminate the conversation come gertrude she said turning to her daughter it is time to retire you ought to feel proud of your polite town friends whispered delima with angry sarcasm as both ladies with a slight inclination left the room gertrude who was last overheard the remark and she involuntarily glanced towards them but there was more of sadness in its expression than of anger at the rudeness of the remark she had overheard delima noticed the look and made it an excuse for the outburst of rage and mortification to which she gave way as the door closed behind them how dare they treat her with the insolent contempt they had done was she not as good as them and what a craven he was to stand tamely by and see her thus insulted ah if he had possessed the spirit of a man he would not have borne it what would you have had me do he at last sternly asked they did not want to know you nor myself either but remonstrance or rebuke were alike unavailing whilst such a tempest of wrath agitated delima's breast her dignity her pride had been in her opinion shamelessly outraged and feeling the inutility of opposing her farther armand turned with a smothered groan to the window and leaned his hot and throbbing brow against it staring with vacant look at the white dashes of snow and sleet that every now and then struck against the panes mentally rose before him in sharp contrast that dignified refined girl 
and the shallow violent-tempered though beautiful woman who called him husband and whose raised angry voice was even now sounding in his ear he shuddered and felt he understood now how men committed suicide and the train of reflection that led to such a desperate deed yes but for the restraining thought of a future existence he could he would free himself from life and its intolerable bondage at length exhausted by her own vehemence delima came to a stop and abruptly opening the door called to a female servant passing to conduct her to her bedroom the latter assented and armand was left alone still he stood at the gloomy window watching the storm outside dreary as that reigning within his own aching heart when he became conscious of fresh arrivals at the inn the neighing of horses tinkle of bells sounds of cheerful voices broke on the night's stillness and then there was stamping of feet as the travellers shook off the snow clinging to them in the outer room and merry calls for a good supper and for something hot in the meantime to restore impeded circulation the voices cultivated enough were somewhat familiar to armand and as he was just wondering under what circumstances he had heard them before the door was thrown open and robert l'esperance and one of his intimate friends entered their delight on seeing armand was rapturous and the latter vainly strove to draw back they did not they would not see that their noisy mirth was unwelcome and pipes with hot water sugar and rum were loudly called for whilst he was playfully forced to the table and seated between them glasses were speedily replenished for the newcomers were hard drinkers and they insisted on doing the same for armand l'esperance himself preparing his portion and making it additionally strong and sweet now whispered armand's better angel leave them you have had enough return to your wife but the thought of being exposed again that night to the latter's merciless tongue was intolerable so he determined on remaining where he was but he would take no more than the one tumbler l'esperance was so energetically and persistently forcing upon him when that was finished however a strange exhilaration had taken possession of him and he felt that a lethe was at hand which could afford him at least a few hours oblivion of his troubles why should he not profit of it yes he would do so in future fully recklessly the stigma attached to a drunkard's name the dishonor poverty and ruin attendant on the victim of intemperance would not restrain him henceforth what had life for him worth living caring or toiling for nothing deliberately he would give himself up to the terrible temptation so suddenly besetting his path surprised delighted at this easy compliance in one who had been so remarkable heretofore for strict self-command l'esperance and his friend sang gay songs told gay stories all the while plying their victim with full glasses till at length they had the satisfaction of seeing him slide gradually down on the sofa utterly stupidly intoxicated then they congratulated themselves on their work and laughed over it he had always been so cursedly finical and stand-off so moral and correct that it was a perfect triumph to have pulled him down from the pedestal on which he had planted himself what amusement they would have with some of the fellows when they got back to montreal telling the story but what a pity it was that armand was not amusing in his cups not one word had he uttered that might not have been said whilst he was sober perhaps he would prove more entertaining the next time at least they would give him a chance and with such light talk they dragged the sleeper into an easy position on the sofa put the pillows of the latter under his head and then throwing his own heavy cloak which lay on an adjoining chair over him left the room 
early the following morning armand was awakened by the maid-servant coming in to set the room in order and singularly enough no unpleasant symptom of his last night's revel remained beyond a slight headache this latter he got rid of by stepping into the kitchen and immersing his head and face in cold water then having smoothed his thick wavy hair as best he could he returned to the sitting-room he understood it all the empty tumblers and other traces of the recent revel the sofa on which he had passed the night yes he had yielded freely fully to the tempter now that his pulse was calm his forehead cool now that reason had returned to her throne was he sorry for the past a sullen look stole over his face and his heart answered no he recalled the exhilaration the recklessness the oblivion his self-indulgence had brought to him and he resolved to return to it again no price could be too dear to pay for such a blessed break in the weary monotonous misery of his life he was sitting absorbed in these thoughts his eyes fixed on the floor when the door softly opened then shut and raising his eyes he saw gertrude de beauvoir standing before him her face was very pale and she leaned one hand on the table as if for support in a low hurried voice she said armand durand may i speak to you with the freedom the frankness of a friend too much surprised and agitated to answer in words the young man merely bowed his head i would ask you then by the memory of the parents who so dearly loved you of the respect you have hitherto won from friend and foe by the recollection of our boy and girl friendship to solemnly promise that you will never yield again to the temptation that mastered you so completely last night armand's face crimsoned ah she knew all his degradation then well what was it to her this proud beautiful being so far removed from his fear from him and his something of the sullen look that had clouded his brow when she had first entered again stole over it and he answered thanks miss de beauvoir for the generous interest you display in my welfare but i would not like to bind myself in the manner you ask temptations strong and irresistible may arise and i will have enough to answer for in yielding to them without having also violated promises to add to the number of my misdeeds i will not take this for my answer i have risked my mother's anger your wife's insults the mockery of your boon companions to make you this appeal surely surely you will listen to it miss de beauvoir i dare not resolutions of doing better i freely offer but beyond that i dare not venture i have tasted once of the cup of oblivion and the draught was too welcome to permit of my solemnly abjuring it but the noble promises of your manhood the talents that god has bountifully endowed you with are all these to be exchanged for a drunkard's degraded life a drunkard's early and unhallowed death life is not so very pleasant to me that i should cling to it he bitterly rejoined oh i know that armand and she involuntarily clasped her hands whilst her eyes filled with tears i heard all that passed my mother and myself occupy the room next to this and despite all efforts of ours every word was audible through the thin board partition then when she left you they came and who can wonder that sorely tried as you had been tempted in your hour of weakness you fell i could scarcely refrain from seeking your side to dash the glass from your hand but my mother was with me and i dared not then i heard them triumphing over your fall laying plans for tempting you in the future and i vowed to myself oh armand durand that with the morning's light i would seek and try to save you greatly affected armand could not trust himself to speak and after vainly waiting for an answer she went on rapidly tremulously you are not the only one to whom the burden of life is a heavy one ah it is no rose-leaf to myself 
but we must not look earthward for our reward arm yourself with generous courage then and instead of wearily sinking on the field battle bravely on till the end still he spoke not and fearing a final refusal she hurriedly added in pity listen to me you will not misjudge the step i have taken and call me unmaidenly but if i am seen here others will still even with the fear of that before me till you give me the promise i ask i will not go be it as you will noble true-hearted friend he answered i promise you solemnly by all i hold most sacred by my honour as a man and christian to never drink of that fatal lethe again i will at least endeavour to prove myself worthy of the generous interest you have deigned to take in one so unworthy as myself her whole face lighted up and she joyfully whispered i know that promise will be faithfully kept and now take this ring and she removed a valuable ruby from her finger wear it not in remembrance of the donor but of the solemn promise you made in the hour it was presented to you the ring which was too large for gertrude and had always been worn in consequence with a guard fitted armand perfectly to be worn he said passing it on his finger as my promise will be kept till death thank you mr durand and now farewell we leave this morning and i probably will not see you again they shook hands and parted when armand was alone he reverently bowed his head and asked for grace to keep his promise inviolate thanking god too that there were such women in this miserable world as gertrude de beauvoir the friendship evinced for him by this generous noble-minded girl raised him even in his own estimation recalling the high earnest aspirations that once were his and filling him with a fervent resolve to be true in future to the better part of his nature he was standing at the window revolving such thoughts and watching the sun that now shone gloriously down on a world of snowy crystals and glittering diamonds when his wife entered the room you are a kind attentive husband was her irate address armand here indicated by a sign that the next room was occupied on which she at once lowered her voice without changing the spirit of her speech it was a shame for you to leave me alone a whole night in a strange house and in a miserable closet of a room full of half-famished rats and mice that kept me awake in mortal terror the whole night long well delima you left me so abruptly and had said so much before leaving that i did not care to expose myself to hear more by following you where then did you pass the night smoking and drinking i suppose you have not divined all the truth yet lying on that sofa stupidly intoxicated if you doubt the truth of my words ask l'esperance and his friend who were the companions of my revel delima's cheek paled she had seen enough of the evils and horrors of drunkenness her father having died a victim of that terrible vice to make her shrink in terror from the idea of a drunkard for a mate armand's refined nature his abhorrence of low or degraded vice had lulled her into a dream of false security from which she now awoke in terror yes she saw the precipice on whose fearful brink she and her husband stood and conscience whispered that her own unbridled tongue and temper were the chief causes of his yielding to temptation yet despite all that she angrily turned on him saying how can you have the face to tell me such a thing armand you should be ashamed of yourself ah i foresaw what my fate would be when i consented to leave friends and home i suppose you want to break my heart so as soon to be rid of me and she burst into a paroxysm of low but passionate weeping he looked at her mentally contrasting her in her unwomanly harshness her weak fretful waywardness with the young girl who a little while previous had stood where she stood now 
and a thought flashed across him that one seemed like his good the other his evil angel that thought however was immediately repressed and he felt relieved when the sound of voices and tinkle of bells called delima in a sudden impulse of curiosity to the window it was as she had guessed mrs de beauvoir and her daughter were stepping into their richly equipped sleigh which was drawn by a pair of splendid chestnut horses grief and anger were alike forgotten in the interest excited by this spectacle and hastily drawing her eyes she inquired of the servant who entered at the moment to prepare the table for the morning meal if the ladies were leaving without taking any breakfast no breakfast for which they had paid liberally had been served to them in their own room but it remained almost untouched the elder lady seemed greatly annoyed by the loss of her night's rest owing to the noise going on in the next room armand winced the girl who spoke was unconscious that the quiet gentlemanly young man before her was one of the ruthless disturbers of mrs de beauvoir's repose but not the less deeply did he feel the shame the humiliation of the moment and it required a glance at the ruby that glistened on his finger to restore his self-possession delima indemnified herself for the disappointment of having lost a second meeting with the de beauvoir ladies by assuming an extraordinary amount of state during breakfast at which meal they were joined by l'esperance and his friend she had at first intended upbraiding the latter two mirthful spirits with great acrimony for the share they had had in armand's shortcomings of the night previous but suddenly remembering the silent quiet dignity of gertrude and the cold hauteur of her mother she enveloped herself in a mantle as it were composed of the characteristics of both and thus agreeably disappointed her husband who was endeavouring to prepare himself for a scene of some sort or other at the same time she greatly imposed on the other two guests who secretly wondered where durand's little country wife had picked up such quality manners as they phrased it End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of Armand Durand by Rosanna Le Proin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The journey to Quebec was performed without farther incident. They arrived late in the evening, and L'Esperance, who was thoroughly acquainted with that ancient city, piloted them to a cheap inn in the lower town where they could pass the time till Armand would have found out a boarding house now durand come and join us said l'esperance heartily after delima thoroughly worn out with her fatiguing journey had retired for the night come we will have pipes and glasses in and make a night of it don't shake your head so solemnly old fellow think what a good time we had at the maple leaf yesterday and you not a bit the worse for it next morning it was the first night of the kind l'esperance that i ever spent and i firmly intend that it shall be the last tis useless asking now for neither persuasion nor mockery can move me still the tempter persisted he did not want to lead armand into any excess he only wished that they should pass a social merry evening together but ever between him and the one whose fall he sought to compass the calm noble face of gertrude rose up at once a shield and safeguard a cheap and tolerably comfortable boarding-house was found by our hero next day and he and his wife installed in it without delay he then sought out mr duchene and on presenting a letter furnished him by belfond was received with marked civility and at once assigned his place in the office which differed very little from the one he had occupied in the rival city except that it was still dingier darker and dirtier of course delima fretted and murmured she found the hills fearfully steep and slippery the streets narrow and dirty and the shops small and mean in their exterior but extortionate in their prices to these complaints childish though they were the young husband listened with more sympathy than he had been accustomed to vouchsafe her latterly 
for delima's health was anything but satisfactory so thought the experienced physician whom he lost no time in consulting and who prescribed delicate nourishment good wine daily driving when the invalid felt unequal to the fatigue of walking with apparently very little beneficial result either the total separation from that arch mischief-maker mrs martel or the hopes of coming maternity exercised a very softening influence on delima's character of childish fretfulness and complaints there was still any amount enough to put dr meunier at times out of all patience but the olden spirit of arrogance and aggression was entirely laid at rest her dependence on armand was now carried into the smallest details and as the hour approached for his return she would seat herself near the window of their little room watching for him if he were at all behind time a thing sometimes the case where messages often devolved on him she would upbraid him with his neglect and indifference declaring he remained away because he found the time passed with her wearisome to a man of a less generous or gentle disposition than armand durand was all this would have proved intolerably irksome but he found an excuse for all moods of her waywardness in her ailing health and lonely isolated condition they had no friends or acquaintances in quebec and they formed none armand knew a few lawyers or students some of whom he had previously met in montreal but the intimacy proceeded no farther than a bow or perhaps a hand greeting in the street fortunately for delima her landlady was a kind motherly person but her housekeeping cares united to her anxieties respecting her boarders and three small children left her little leisure to talk or listen to her new lodger new year's day was at hand and it dawned on the old city with a sun of wonderful brilliancy but though the cold was severe the sleighing was splendid and the sky without a cloud the streets were filled with horses of every colour and vehicles of every description these latter crowded chiefly with the sterner sex for on that special festival the feminine part of the population remain at home to receive their male friends dressed in a plain dark dressing-gown for her love of finery and dress seemed almost to have deserted her delima looking very quiet and dull was seated in her easy armchair which was drawn up close to the window to enable her to look on the gay scene without a quick light step sounded on the stairs and armand entered see si, mrs durand he gaily said i have brought you your ecrenne new year's gift and as he spoke he opened and handed her a tiny pasteboard box where nestling in a layer of cotton wadding was a small though very pretty brooch she took it whilst a faint smile lighted up her beautiful face and with an attempt at her olden coquetry fastened it in her dress it becomes you very well indeed but next year we must have something costlier this speech touched some painful chord or presentiment in the young wife's breast and bursting into tears she sobbed forth armand armand my heart tells me i shall never see another new year grieved by her despondency durand did his best to coax or laugh her out and taking her hand he gently said say dear wife is there anything you would wish me to do for you i have but one wish in the world now but i know you would never consent to it so i need not name it an inkling of the truth flashed across our hero's mind causing him to fairly shudder with dismay but he looked at the pale tearful young face beseechingly raised to his and he courageously asked what is it to have cousin martel here to take care of me through all my troubles armand's mind took in at once the worry the domestic storms the intense discomfort comprehended in this simple sentence and he remained silent his companion went on 
you know old miss dupre who occupied the little room next to us has gone to spend the winter with her friends in three rivers so we could get it for cousin martel she would willingly come if we asked her and it would be such a comfort to have her with me instead of sitting moping alone here all day oh do dear armand consent it was not in durand's nature to refuse so he rejoined i suppose i must not say no to any request made on new year's day so write to her when you like and tell her we will pay all her expenses how good you are armand i fear she would not come without that i had to pay her out of the housekeeping money for the pretty dresses she bought me when i first came from st laurent and now let me look again at my pretty brooch i have not felt so cheerful for a long time whatever durand's secret thoughts were he kept them to himself and new year's day closed more pleasantly for the young couple than it had dawned mrs martel most willingly accepted the invitation and in what seemed to the young husband a miraculously short time arrived with her trunk and bandboxes lodged and boarded at armand's expense she felt obliged to behave at least tolerably well but her eternal presence in the one little room appertaining to him was in itself a sore trial of course the invalid now consumed mysteriously enough a double quantity of wine and dainties without gaining any extra plumpness thereby but armand found no fault as long as he was able to meet all these extra expenses which he contrived to do by practising rigid economy where his personal tastes or pleasures were concerned and by toiling late and early over the copying which mr duchesne in pursuance of a promise made to belfond plentifully procured him one afternoon that he had mentioned to delima the probability of his early return owing to a half holiday granted at the office he was agreeably surprised on entering to find her alone where is mrs martel he asked i have sent her out on a couple of messages that will keep her busy till dark the truth is armand i am tired of her well that is something new i fear next you will be growing tired of myself and sending me off also ah there's no danger of that since i have lived with you here alone without someone always talking ill of you and putting mischief into my head i feel very differently towards you armand i have been anything but a good wife nonsense little delima don't mind that we'll all turn over a new and very pleasant leaf soon you will turn it over alone my husband and i honestly wish it may be a happy one was the quiet low-toned reply why i'll really begin to wish for old cousin martel after all if you talk in this unreasonable manner no no it was decreed that you should die a judge's wife and when we remember that i have not passed my examination yet you will see there is a long lease of life allotted you she shook her head but made no attempt to prevent her husband from diverting the conversation into a more cheerful channel both the young people looked up regretfully when mrs martel flushed and important bustled into the room after loquaciously detailing the fatigues of her expedition her escapes from falls on slippery sidewalks runaway horses from robbers under guise of extortionate shopkeepers she displayed her purchases enlarging on her own superior skill in bargaining as successfully opposed to the chicanery of the tradesmen with whom she had had to contend this latter fruitful topic exhausted she suddenly discovered that the apartment was cold and flinging back the stove door with a loud crash threw in several billets of wood wondering all the while how armand could sit quietly there and let the room get so very cold but it is quite warm enough cousin martel and we have already an excellent fire besides interposed armand dr meunier has specially interdicted keeping the room too hot he says it weakens delima that for dr meunier's opinions or indeed for those of any other inexperienced young man and she disdainfully snapped her fingers together i should think i know something about nursing and sick-rooms by this time 
here it must be premised that a brisk warfare had been inaugurated between delima's medical attendant and mrs martel from the first arrival of the latter that worthy matron instinctively opposing every injunction or recommendation of the higher authority dr meunier would cheerfully enter the room and after commenting on the beauty of the weather suggest a walk or a drive according to circumstances just heavens go out to-day doctor why she would freeze to death look outside at the icicles hanging to the horses noses she needn't look at them ma'am if they frighten her would be the unceremonious reply or perhaps he would make his visit on some occasion when under favour of armand's absence and her own management the apartment was hot as a furnace and he would savagely inquire which object she had in view roasting the patient alive at once or weakening her to death by the same atrocious expenditure of caloric weakening her indeed doctor mrs martel would indignantly reply a good fire or good food never weakened anybody yet i want no old woman's fancies if you please ma'am in this sick room they have killed more unfortunates than disease has ever done you want to kill her your own way his feminine antagonist would murmur sotto voce in dr meunier's absence his orders were still more systematically set at defiance the open-air exercise or drive would be adjourned to a more favourable day the stove piled full of wood and more than this the physician's tonics or draughts set aside under plea that a bowl of broth or a glass of warm negus would prove more beneficial than nasty drugs now though mrs martel had no faith in the physician's preparations she had a considerable amount of it in her own tisanes and liberally supplied the invalid with them this latter measure however was known only to herself for quiet as armand was in other respects she knew he would never tolerate so audacious a revolt against medical authority though probably ignorant of the half of mrs martel's shortcomings dr meunier had already expressed his opinion regarding her in the plainest terms to our hero concluding his remarks on one occasion by saying were she a hired nurse mr durand i would certainly take her by the shoulders and turn her out in consequence of this opinion armand sounded his wife as to the possibility of their visitor being induced to shorten her stay at present under the condition of making up for it by a longer visit at a later time but the mention of such a thing threw delima into a paroxysm of weeping during which she passionately declared that she knew if mrs martel left her now she would never see her again the subject was in consequence abandoned and matters remained in the same condition till the arrival of the event so anxiously expected poor delima's sad presentiments of the last few weeks were only too well founded and the evening of the day that saw armand a father found him sitting pale and awestruck like one in some terrible dream beside the lifeless forms of wife and child a few words of farewell to her husband a passionate kiss on the baby brow yet moist from the waters of baptism and on which the chill damps of death were already gathering and the spirit of the young wife had passed into eternity almost immediately followed by that of her sinless child rarely had funereal tapers shed their pallid light on two lovelier relics of sad humanity than on that beautiful young mother and her infant death had sharpened without rendering harsh the feeble lineaments of early infancy till the little waxen face bore a startling resemblance to the placid statuesque countenance beside which it lay on the snow-white pillow in the course of the long night that the new-made widower passed beside that hushed quiet bed he had shortly almost sternly refused all offers of companionship during his last sad watch sharp and severe was the self-examination he mentally subjected himself to he felt he had never loved her to whom he had solemnly vowed love at the altar 
but then he had been faithful and had cherished her in sickness as in health bearing perhaps more patiently with her faults and foibles than if she had been throned in his inmost heart ah conscience was all the easier now that he had suffered and borne in patience instead of retaliating even when he had had good cause for doing so he could now gaze sadly down on that beautiful face without reading reproach in its pallid marble features and without tormenting himself with vain regrets that he could not expiate a past which was now beyond his reach from the hour armand lost his wife a remarkable change became apparent in the tone and demeanour of his whilom landlady mrs martel the half familiar half defiant manner that had characterized her since his entrance into her family entirely disappeared and the olden courtesy which had marked her first intercourse with her young gentleman lodger resumed after seeing poor delima laid in the quiet cemetery of st louis she impressively bade the young widower farewell feeling that all future intercourse between them was at an end a supposition in which she was not mistaken End of chapter eighteen